Hi, I'm Gary Katz. I want to thank all the folks who bought copies of my DVD programs over the last 20 years. If it wasn't for their support and the support of companies like Windsor One and Stabila, I never would have been able to produce what turned out to be a 10 program series on mastering finished carpentry. Those 12 to 20 year old videos look pretty terrible compared to streaming video today. And that's why I'm no longer selling the DVDs, but the carpentry techniques haven't aged much at all. And that's why I'm making them available here for free. Enjoy. Welcome back to Mastery and Finish Carpentry. And if you're new to this series, you should know that in past programs, we've already covered the fundamentals of trim carpentry. Mastering the miter saw, installing casing and baseboard, and conquering crown molding. Today, we're back in my shop and studio to work on wainscoting and paneling. And I promise this program's going to be fun. We're gonna be moving quickly. There's a lot of material to cover. Many of you may have seen my wainscoting presentations at national trade shows or at the Cats Road Show, and many of you also have years of experience as carpenters, so some of this may be familiar, but let's cover the basics anyway, just in case. On most jobs, with most crews, there's usually a layout guy. That's usually the fellow running the crew, the guy who does all the door hanging, cornice designs, and wainscoting layouts. I've been that guy for years and I can tell you it's the hardest part of the job and requires real care. Doing layout is like setting up a repetitive stop system on a miter saw then handing it off to one of your carpenters. You better be sure the stops are set right on before the handoff or you'll end up with a lot of wasted molding. I rely on technology to increase quality and productivity on my jobs. To make sure my layouts are spot on, technology helps me move faster too. Sure, buying high-tech tools costs money, but investing in tools is like investing in stocks. You want ones that pay the best dividends, so quality and durability are big issues when selecting tools. I'll have a lot more to say about tools and materials as we move through this program. In the past, I've received letters and notes from viewers who have suggested I say more about the products I'm using. I'll be doing that in this program, so don't get the wrong idea. I'm not trying to sell anyone anything. Yeah, some of the products I'll be talking about are made by companies who sponsor these programs, but the reason they sponsor the programs is because I wanted to use their products, not because they asked me to. I think you might be interested in using some of these tools and materials too. You can use high quality levels like these for laying out wainscoting, but it's slow and imprecise and often requires two carpenters. If the room you're working in has a lot of windows and doors and corners, you'll be switching between long and short levels and by the time you work your way all the way around the room, especially if it's a large room, you could be off by more than an inch in height. Using lasers for laying out wainscoting is precise and fast and can be accomplished by one guy working alone. If you invest in a good laser, believe me, you'll be using it a lot. Lasers have a lot of uses outdoors too, for setting form boards, installing siding and trim, laying out pitch and drainage for a driveway. They're great inside a home for finding the high point of a floor before setting kitchen cabinets. And while you're at it, finding the low point of the ceiling, especially if the crown molding installs right on top of the cabinet doors. Lasers are perfect for finding the high point in a room before setting a series of exterior doors too especially French doors or windows where all the mutton bars have to line up perfectly level. In fact, in many homes, you have to shoot control lines to ensure that all your jams and head casings line up on the inside of a home, from windows to doors, both interior and exterior. Nothing's faster or more accurate than high quality lasers. Ironically, window and door alignment is critical in two important architectural styles. In many craftsman style homes, a continuous band molding runs across the top of all the windows and doors. If the tops of the windows and doors aren't level, you'll have to solve problems like this builder did by adding an extra level of molding or a trim strip on the top of the door jamb. What could have been straight clean lines ended up muddied because careful detail wasn't followed. In colonial homes, both federal and Georgian, proportion and consistency are paramount design features. 
So the size of all the windows on each floor are the same, the same height and the same width. And often, the chair rail runs right under the window sills. In fact, the chair rail and the stool are one and the same. This is a piece of Windsor One chair rail from the classical colonial style. Later in the program, when we get to chair rail, we'll cope this piece of molding. But right now, notice how wide the profile is on the top. This molding is designed for installation as both chair rail and stool with enough room on top for thick casing. That's another reason to use a laser before you set the windows and doors, but definitely when you're installing wainscoting. For wainscoting, the laser has to be at exactly the right height. I like to shoot my line right here at the bottom of the chair rail, the top of the top rail, because that's the line I'll build to. If that line is right, then the chair rail height is right. I like to use a simple laser, one that shoots a bright horizontal line and plumb dots. That's about everything a finished carpenter needs. Of course, it has to be accurate within an eighth of an inch over 50 feet. I prefer a laser that has a pendulum lock too. So while it's stored in your tool bucket or box, or even a small laser in your nail bags, getting bounced around, the instrument won't get whacked out of adjustment. These tools are expensive and they need to be durable. And if you're shooting in a brightly lit room or even outdoors, get one of the new pulsing lasers which works with a detector. Lasers have changed a lot in the last year or so. With a pulsing laser, you can do both interior and exterior work with one tool. Here's Stabila's latest laser. It's so new I wasn't able to use it earlier in this program. I didn't get it until after we shot the video. This laser fits almost every need a finished carpenter has. It shoots plumb dots and it shoots a horizontal line. One horizontal line and that's all. But that's mostly all we need as finished carpenters. It's a pulsing laser too. So you can use it outdoors or indoors in a large room with a detector. The detector will pick up the laser line and you'll get a tone. The laser's accurate to a quarter of an inch over a hundred feet, and that's an eighth of an inch in 50 feet, and it's durable. It has a pendulum lock on the back of it here. That's how you turn the laser on. So the guts of the instrument, you can hear the pendulum in there, don't get banged around while you're not using it. And with this rubber casing on the outside, it can take almost anything you throw at it. There's several choices for mounting lasers. A laser jam works great because unlike a tripod, you can slide the laser up and down from a few inches off the floor to a few inches off the ceiling. FastCap's laser jam runs about $200, but they're built well and have exact scales. They'll last indefinitely if you take good care of them. If you're working under a vaulted ceiling like this one, you can use a bucket mount with a laser jam, and that way, you can place the laser anywhere in the room you want. FastCap also makes this third hand, and it's another great mounting tool for a laser. It works just like the laser jam, and it's easy to set up underneath a door jam or underneath a soffit like this one. The laser jam has extensions on it as well, and you can run these things up to 8, 10, 12 foot ceilings if you need to. The third hand also doubles as a temporary plastic wall, you know, like a zip wall. I could go on and on talking about laser mounts, but one of my favorite tools is a lightweight, inexpensive camera tripod like this one. Every carpenter should carry one of these in their truck because they come in handy for taking pictures of your work especially when it's a little dark on a job site and have to shoot at a slow shutter speed. If you want to write an article about the job you're doing, you've got to take pictures. And by the way, if you don't understand what a slow shutter speed is, email me. You'll need to know that if you want to take good pictures of your work.
If you're laying out paneling for several rooms, mark all the corners in the first room, as well as a few marks in the second room. Then take the laser, set it up in the second room, and dial in the height to match the line in the previous room. That way you can just keep going. That's the way I shoot control lines through an entire house, because you can't set up the laser in just one location and get the whole house. First I'm going to turn this laser on, and then I'm going to push this button here on the side so I get a nice bright horizontal line. That's all I need here. And I'm going to adjust that line so it's right on the top of the paneling. Not the top of the chair, the bottom of the chair, which is at the top of the panel line. So I want to continue this line and mark it all the way around the room. So I'll come over to this corner and I'll put a little like arrow right there so we know that's the top of the line and in the inside corner on the other side we'll do the same thing and on this outside corner we'll do exactly the same thing and around this end as well and again in this inside corner oh look how how bad the drywall is it's cracking in the corner well that's not going to matter because we're going to cover all that with wainscoting and all the way over at this end of the room right next to the casing We'll put a line there too. We have marks at the laser line all the way around the room. And that's how quickly you can lay out a room with a laser. With a level, it would have taken a lot longer. Especially around those outside corners on that pop-out. Okay, we're through with this. Now let's take a look at another high-tech tool. This little gadget's going to change the way carpenters work. Believe me. In another few years, every carpenter will be carrying one of these on their tool belt like an iPod. I use this tool when I'm measuring baseboard so I don't have to crawl across the floor. I can set it up in one corner and get the dot right on the opposite corner, or in this case on that plinth block, and then push the button one more time. And it'll give me a distance measurement right here on the tool. Then I can check that. Sometimes you want to get two or three readings of the same measurement and you can push the button real fast a couple of times in the same place and you'll get all your measurements stacked up on the same right underneath each other because the laser distance measuring tool remembers those measurements. I'm going to read in the opposite direction too without having to crawl across the floor and even if there's a ladder in the way or there's something like there is here I can pick up a measurement I'm going to hit the button a couple of times here and get a few measurements on that. It's a 104, perfect. All three of those are 104, exactly right on. So I'm pretty certain that I've got a good measurement there. You try and take two or three measurements of every, of every length like that, just to make sure that you've got the dot in the right location, because if the dot ends up in a little hole sometimes, you'll end up with an imprecise measurement. This tool is great for measuring floor to ceiling panels too, where you have to stretch a tape measure over your head. You don't have to see this display. Just place the tool right on the floor, the surface you want to measure from. Locate the red laser dot on the opposite surface and press the same button a second time. I'll take a couple of measurements here just to be safe so I can average them out. These instruments are really sensitive and they're highly accurate. Stabilis distance lasering, laser measuring device is accurate to within a sixteenth of an inch and there are very few in the industry that are that accurate. For framers and remodelers, it's a perfect tool. Imagine being able to measure a rafter length without stretching out a tape measure. Or measuring plate lengths, or fascia, or soffit trim, or you can probably get the picture. If you can't get the picture, here's a few to look at. Whether you're measuring a gable end stud or a tall wall stud on the ground or in the air, you don't have to worry about stretching a tape measure. Unlike finished carpenters, framers are always working in the air. With a distance laser tool, you don't need two guys for measuring long joists or rafters. Distance measuring tools are great for wainscoting. They help measure the top rail right at the rail line at the top, even on a really long wall rather than measuring down here at the floor, which is where there's usually a lot more drywall buildup in the inside corners. Plus, there's times when I like to get the longest measurement. Sometimes it's at the top, sometimes it's at the bottom. This tool is great for picking up both top and bottom measurements at the same time, which is something I often do at outside corners. You know, we can't really talk about measuring wainscoting without talking about different corner types. 
and different frame types. So we're going to have to bounce around the subject a little bit here, talk about several different things at once. Years ago, I learned a great trick about measuring wainscoting from Jed Dixon. Jed's a stair builder from Rhode Island. He's a frequent contributor to JLC Live, mag to JLC Magazine. He does the JLC Live shows, and he taught me to never ever measure wainscoting right on. For frames that go from inside corner to inside corner, always subtract a quarter of an inch from the wall length. That trick by itself will save you hours of head scratching. And with that one lesson from Jed, I developed a whole new way of laying out wainscoting, and here's the system I've been using. It might seem complicated, but really it's pretty simple, based almost entirely on the different types of wall situations we work with. In most homes, there are three primary wall situations, but only two basic rules for measuring them. Rule number one, two of the most common walls we work on have inside corners on both ends or inside corners on one end and casing or something like that on the other end. For those walls, always subtract a quarter of an inch. That way, you can install your first frame without scribing or fussing around or anything. Just take your frame, put it on your laser line, and nail it in place. If you're installing another inside corner to inside corner piece or an inside corner that butts up against a piece of casing on the next piece, with the first frame in place, the second one's going to be about a half an inch too long because you're making them all a quarter of an inch short. When you put the second piece on, you're going to pick up the three quarters of an inch of the first panel. So the second panel coming out of an inside corner will end up being about oh, a half an inch too long. Set your scribes for a half an inch and scribe off to the leading edge, the back edge, of the second frame. Just like so. That way, the frames will fit tight together and the style sizes will be very similar, within about a quarter of an inch of each other. Because you take a half an inch off of this style and you're burying a half inch of three quarters of an inch of this style, so they're going to be within a quarter of an inch of each other. Yeah, some of you may have noticed, if you use the same size styles for the corners as you use for the field styles, the two inside corner styles won't match the field styles because you're going to lose a half inch to three quarters of an inch off these inside corner styles because of the overlap. The inside styles will end up being between three and three and a quarter inches wide, which is pretty darn close and most folks would never see the difference. But if you're a fastidious carpenter, there's another way you can assemble your frames. Make sure you use three and a half inch styles for all your outside corners and ends that butt against casing. And then use four inch styles for all of your inside corners, the ones that overlap each other. I've got a four inch style on the inside corner of this frame and a four inch style on the inside corner of this frame. Whereas all the other field styles are three and a half inches. That way, when you install an inside corner, the second frame will cover about a half inch of the first frame. You'll scribe a half inch off of the second frame, so both frames will end up being about three and a half inches. That's the method I'll be using throughout this program. Before we get to rule number two, let's review rule number one, and this time we'll look at a SketchUp drawing. Here's another wall that has casing on one end and an inside corner on the other. For these frames, always subtract a quarter inch and leave the gap on the inside corner. That way the frame can be installed with minimal fitting or cutting. Just scribe it to the casing. Rule number one also applies to walls with inside corners on both ends. Always subtract a quarter of an inch. If the frame is installed on top of a previous frame, scribe a half inch off the right hand style. However, by a subtracting a quarter inch, you can also choose to start installing your frames anywhere in the room. Now let's look at rule number two. The third common type of wall situation in most homes is an inside corner to an outside corner. Just like this wall here. An inside corner to an outside corner. Sure, there are other corners in construction, like outside corner to outside corner walls around pilasters, and angles too, acute angles, obtuse angles. But I've always felt that too many rules just get me into trouble. So I only have two of them and they're just for the three most common types of walls we work with. Remember, simple rules are really cool things if they help you shave time off of a job and prevent silly mistakes, and if you follow them. When you measure an inside corner to an outside corner wall, always add a half an inch. Yeah, it's different than the first rule. The first rule said you subtract a quarter of an inch, 
for inside corner to inside corner walls. But when you measure an inside corner to an outside corner wall, you add a half an inch. That's probably more than you'll really need to scribe the piece tight to the previous frame, but not a lot more. And you can usually scribe all the extra length right off this inside corner style, especially if you use inside corner styles that are half inch wider than your field styles. The other reason for that extra length is because for an outside corner, you'll want at least three quarters of an inch extra to make up the corner joint. While we're here measuring this outside corner, remember, always measure these frames at the top and the bottom. Let me move this out of the way a little. And pick the longest measurement. I learned that the hard way too, along with a lot of other things. These pop-out walls on this job right here are pretty short. But if the walls are really long and you can't reach them with a tape measure, sometimes it's really tough to hit them with a tape measure. A distance measuring tool really simplifies that task too. To use a laser distance measuring tool on an outside corner, just hold the device up against a piece of wood or against your level and then read to the corner. Measuring and making your frames long enough to allow for the extra material you need on an outside corner is a wise move and always allows you the flexibility of fitting every frame to the job on the job. And I'm going to be getting into that a lot more too. It allows you to decide on the job what direction you want to lap your corners. Trust me, cutting nice corner joints on a job site isn't tough to do if you have the right tools. In fact, these lap joints they're pretty easy to do, but notice how clumsy this one looks with all this end grain showing. That's another example of what not to do on an outside corner. For now, let's just stick with measuring. Let's review rule number two and look at that SketchUp drawing one more time. For walls with outside corners on one end, always add a half an inch. Whether you decide to install those frames first, or whether you install them after a previous frame, you'll always have enough material to make up the outside corner. And you'll be able to lap the outside corner in either direction. That covers the three common types of walls we run into. Now, there's two more types of walls in a home, but no more rules. For all other corners, I always make a drawing. For an outside corner to outside corner wall, like a pilaster or a large pop-out, I figure out which sides are going to be the jams, the side with the narrow face, and which sides will be the casing side, the wider side. I try to make the casing side of the pilaster the public side, the side that most people will see. Like I said, I always carry a short level when I'm laying out and measuring wainscoting frames. I check both sides of every pop-out just to make sure that they're plumb. If they're out to lunch, then I add even more wiggle room to the size of the frame. So there's enough room to scribe the frame. You know, whatever it takes to install the frame and make the joints close and the panels fairly plumb. At the same time, you can't fix a home by making everything perfectly plumb and square. If you install your wainscoting panels perfectly plumb on an out-to-lunch wall, then the top of the chair rail is going to show the whole defect. So you'll see a piece of chair rail that tapers to nothing when it comes to the next wall. Try and see the whole picture before committing yourself to anything. I've mentioned angled walls a couple of times. Before we get to outside corner designs, let's make sure we cover this subject really thoroughly. I used to miter my 135 degree inside corners, and those are the ones that we think are like 22 and a half or 45s, but they're really 135 degree obtuse angles. I used to miter all of those because I thought it was the right thing to do. But look at this mock-up. Here's one of those corners. I've double cut these two pieces. So there's a 135 degree inside corner. Wood moves against the grain. Remember that, not with the grain. These boards are going to move in two directions across the face of both these pieces. So the miter, when it opens, is going to open up twice as much when the wood contracts. Once the wood contracts and the miter opens, boom, it's going to be visible and facing right into the room. I don't miter wide-angled inside corners anymore. 
I always overlap one frame with the other. You might think a miter joint reflects more craftsmanship, but it really doesn't because wood movement must be considered whenever you're making wainscoting. But lapping the joint doesn't mean you have to bevel cut both frames. The first frame can be butt cut because the second frame overlaps it. And the finished joint will look just like a miter. The short point will be in exactly the same place as a miter. A beveled joint won't open nearly as much, and if it does, you'd have to be standing right against this wall, this one right here, to see this joint open up. And besides, a lap joint gives you a chance to get some glue and fasteners through both pieces. You can nail right through this piece and get some glue behind there too. And best of all, a lap joint only takes half as long to cut. You know, there are a lot of other issues we need to cover. Since we're on the subject of outside corners, let's talk about corner joinery now. When I started installing wainscoting, I mitered all my outside corners. Seems like the easiest thing to do. Just cut a bevel joint on each piece, miter them up, glue them, and nail them together. To trim the panels, I used a shooting stick and a circular saw. I work mostly in northern Arizona and southern California. Humidity changes and moisture content hasn't been something I've had to worry much about at all. But in the last 10 years or so, traveling around the country, meeting other carpenters, seeing job sites in almost every state, and visiting historic homes too, I've learned how wood movement can wreck a carpenter's best efforts and ruin a really good reputation. Miters move a lot, especially on the material we use these days, fresh growth lumber. Visit my website and take a look at the two articles on why miters move. One's on the charts and drawings page and the other's on the trim techniques page. The point of both these articles is simple. Try to avoid miters on outside corners. Here's a few corner designs that are easy to cut on a job site with a circular saw and a guide rail or a shooting stick along with a single bit router setup. The most common corner used around the country for wainscoting is a lap joint. This is a nice joint, and it's simple, and it doesn't require a router. It looks good in stain grade or paint grade work. This joint's pretty common on craftsman style homes too. On a craftsman style home, you can emphasize these butt joints. Just to ease the back edge on both frames, the back edge of this one and this one, using a laminate trimmer and a 16th inch roundover bit. You can even use a slightly bigger roundover bit and emphasize them a little more. Then when you install the paneling, the joint will pop right out from the wall. That's why it's called an emphasized or emphatic joinery. You see that type of emphasized joinery on a lot of green and green homes, like the Gamble House. Notice how the finger joints in this knee wall shelf are eased over dramatically. You can see the same joinery outside the house in these planter boxes. Let's look at some other outside corners too, ones that I've drawn using SketchUp. With the right setup, this is an easy joint to cut because both cuts are made with exactly the same router setup. They're the same depth and width. This is my favorite joint actually and we'll use it in this program a little later. This corner joint is a double lock rabbit and requires two routers, one for the rabbit and one for the dado. With this mechanical joint, the corner can never spread open and the pieces are easy to assemble. Like the first butt joint corner, Allow for the three-quarter inch edge grain in the full style by reducing the width of the lap style so that both styles have equal exposure. Here's one more corner joint. It's a double rabbet too, but one side's cut much deeper so the overlap is thin. For stain grade work, thin joints like this are easier to hide, but they're not nearly as durable and they take a lot more time to cut. For those two reasons, I've rarely used a joint like this. Here's a single pass rabbited corner. Only one frame is rabbited, and the rabbit can be cut pretty deep so that the lap joint is thin and almost invisible. Don't cut the rabbit too deep though. You don't want the lap too delicate. Remember, these joints are going to swell and contract a little, so they may telegraph through the paint some. Personally though, I've never found a straight telegraph line to be nearly as offensive as an open miter. Oh, and since we're on the subject of outside corner joints, there's one other joint we should look at. Beadboard and V-groove paneling is wainscoting too, even if it doesn't have styles. Mitering beadboard on an outside corner cannot be done reliably in most climates. Instead, try this trick that I learned from an attendee at a JLC Live clinic. This is a great technique. It hides almost all future wood movement. Even if the joint cracks a little, no one will guess what's going on. 
and it's not too difficult to cut either. We've covered measuring techniques and corner joinery. Now, before we take any final measurements for this room, let's do what carpenters do best, solve a problem. When we install wainscoting, whether it's in a new house or a remodel, one of the biggest problems we encounter is terminating the frames at the door and window casing. Often, the frame thickness is the same as the thickness of the casing, sometimes even more. Imagine this 1x6 is a frame, you know, a, a wainscoting frame. It's almost perfectly flush with the casing, which I don't especially like. Being almost flush makes it harder to scribe, but even if the scribe's tight, the flush joint just doesn't look as good. There should be some kind of separation, an elevation, or a step between the two details. Most carpenters think the traditional method is to remove the wall board all the way to the chair rail. And yes, that works. It works really good. But on a remodel, it's a mess. And it's not always necessary. Instead, let's look at a few other traditional methods, ones that are often overlooked for solving the same problem. Here's one method. After scribing the frame to fit, you can ease the edge over craftsman style, just like I've done with this router and an edge easing bit. And then, even though the joint's tight and they're flush, it looks good. That's because it's an emphasized joint. But we don't always work in craftsman style homes, and emphasized joinery isn't the only solution. So here's another alternative. I picked up this detail from Tom Nigo, one of the contributors to the JLC Finnish Carpentry Forum. You'll see some more of Tom's work during this program and his brother Charles too. On this style, Tom ran a quirk and bead bit down the edge before installing the frame. I like the way he stopped the bit right below the chair rail location. That little bevel looks really nice. One other thing I want to point out while we're here solving the casing problem, if you don't remove the drywall and install the wainscoting against the bare studs, you're going to have a problem with the baseboard too. Without a plinth block, the baseboard will be proud of the casing for sure, and self-returning the baseboard to the bottom of the frame at every door opening looks clumsy. The best solution I've found, and it seems to work every time, is to install plinth blocks, just like Tom did in that last photograph. These Windsor One classical craftsman plinth blocks aren't quite deep enough to install full three quarter inch frame paneling and put the baseboard on top of the wainscoting. They're about an inch and a half thick, so the base would be almost flush. Actually, it's a little bit proud of the plinth block. That doesn't look right either. It looks clumsy. It's easy to make thicker blocks too. If the blocks are getting too proud of the casing, then chamfer the top edge or put some kind of detail on it. You can cut these chamfers like I did on this piece with a miter saw or with a router. And another thing, if you're replacing the plinth blocks, cheat a little. Make them flush with the back of the casing. Once the wainscoting's on, no one's gonna ever notice that the plinth block is perfectly flush with the casing. That's going to make it a lot easier to install the frames. Take another look at Tom's work and notice that he held the plinth blocks flush on the right side of the casing. That's thinking ahead. With the plinth block flush, it's much easier to scribe the frame to fit tightly against the casing all the way down past the plinth block. I think Tom's idea of running a bead down the frame is a good one, but there's one more alternative design I want to show you, and it solves both the casing and the baseboard problem. In fact, let's look one more time at Tom's photograph. Notice there's not enough room for the thickness of baseboard on the right side of the casing. Sure, Tom didn't install base and it looks just fine with shoe molding, but even the shoe molding is almost flush with the plinth. There's no reason why we can't make these plinth blocks even thicker. Look at some of these examples. 
At the Nightingale Brown House in Providence, Rhode Island, the Colonial Revival doorways are trimmed with crosset architrave casing. Those are the little ears or jogs on each side of the door head. The casing is completed by a heavy oval back band carved with a repeating acanthus ellipse. The back band and the baseboard terminates onto the back of the plinth blocks, which are almost two inches thick. To mask that extreme depth, the carpenters chamfered the face of the block so that the back edge remains thick enough to provide a step down to the baseboard elevation, yet the front edge isn't so massive. In the same home, but dating from probably the original Georgian design, the casing terminates against a horizontal plinth block, which is shorter than the height of the baseboard. In this case, the depth of the back band provides a proper termination for the torus or base cap molding. Here's another example from the same home, but in stain grade with a rococo curve. The rope molding on top of the baseboard terminates against the back of the back band. In this example from the Huntington Library in Los Angeles, the plinth block and baseboard are flush in both directions. The back band isn't thick enough to accommodate the heavy torus molding, so the carpenters self-return the torus. I think it's good for us to see how carpenters have used some of the same creative solutions we use to solve problems. The Sells home in Columbus, Ohio was built at the turn of the century, a combination of Richardson Romanesque Victorian architecture influenced kind of by the arts and crafts movement. The baseboard's chamfered, it's angled away from the wall. To accommodate the thickness of the baseboard, the carpenters came up with a unique solution. They milled a second casing profile from thicker stock and used that as a tall, exaggerated plinth. Given all these great examples, it wasn't tough for me to come up with a solution for this door. I just made another plinth block. This one's an inch and three quarters thick and wide enough to accommodate a similar sized back band. I think I'll put a shim underneath here just to hold it still and get it up tight. That'll hold it and keep a tight straight line right here using this board as a straight edge and I can screw this plinth right into the wall. There we go. And there's the back band. The back band here flushes out with the back of the plinth block so it's easy to scribe the panel to fit. And I chamfered the back band on both edges so it fits in with this craftsman look. The top of the back band, see here, is dead flush with the top of the paneling. So when the chair rail goes in, the chair rail will sit right on top of the back band. But that's another detail and we'll get to that later. Installing this back band reduces the frame size by a full three quarters of an inch. <laughs> but with this back band design detail solved, we're ready to take final measurements. Now that we've looked at corner joints and casing and baseboard details, we're ready to take some real measurements. Let's start on this same wall with the window and move to our left through the room. The stool isn't installed on this window yet because we're replicating a colonial style window where the stool is also the chair rail. And we'll install the window casing later too, along with the jam extensions, and we'll put all of that on top of the stool after the frames are installed. This wall here from the back band measures. Let me get my dot up a little closer to the laser line there and I'll take a couple of readings here. Measures 95 inches right on so I'll make this 94 and 3 quarters right since it has an inside corner on a and a butt end we subtract a quarter of an inch so the frame should measure 94 and 3 quarters. And now let's do this next one. I read that one twice. It measures 10 and 7 eighths both times. It has an inside corner on one end and an outside corner on the other. So that's rule number two. I have to add a half an inch. So the frame size on this one will be 11 and 3 eighths. I'll put that down here too. I'll read this a couple of times. This one measures 21 and an eighth. 
this is rule number two because this is an inside to an outside corner, so we need to add a half an inch. So this one's going to be 21 and an eighth. We'll have to make this 21 and 5 eighths for this inside corner to an outside corner panel. So we'll write that down right here, 21 and 5 eighths. There we go. So we got three of the walls. We got one more left to do. And let's measure from the right where we made the mark at the laser line right onto the other mark. And I'll get a couple of measurements right there. One more just to be certain. And that is 104 and a quarter right on. Let's check the bottom. This wall's got a little hole in it in the corner, so I'm going to take a couple of readings right onto the face of the drywall. And they're all exactly the same. 104 and 3 16 So one of, we had 104 and a quarter at the top and 104 and 3 16 at the bottom. So I'm going to just make this panel figure it's 104 and a quarter. That's a little bit longer. It'll give us a little extra wiggle room, which is a good thing. So we got to subtract a quarter of an inch, but I also want to subtract three quarters of an inch from that measurement so I can install a back band against this casing. So that makes a full inch I have to subtract from that 104 and a quarter measurement. The frame we're going to make for this wall, it's going to be 103 and a quarter inch long frame. So I'll write that down too. You know, with all the measurements taken, you can build the frames in a job site shop or even in your own shop where you don't have to trudge through the mud and set up tools every day, where you have good dust collection and plenty of parking too. You know, where it's warm and dry and cozy. And you know what? You even got your dog there. Like I said, we'll get into more advanced issues later, like architectural styles, tall and wide panels, multiple panels, and stuff like that. But right now, let's cover simple frame and panel style layout. I mean, how to do the math. I rely on technology for that too. First, I want to explain how I used to do this. I used to look at a wall and guess what size the panels might look best. Say I wanted 10 inch panels. I'd measure the wall, figure roughly how many panels would fit and how many styles there'd be. I always had to make a drawing first too. You know what I mean? In order to count how many panels and how many styles. I'm sure some of you do the same thing. Not a fancy drawing, just something simple, you know, like, like this. You take a drawing and we want to put in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, so there's one, two, three, four, five, six panels, and we'll put one more panel in. There's seven panels. See, it's easy. Now I can count the number of styles in a second. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight styles. I've always had to make a drawing to figure that out. The next step I've always made is figuring out the size of the panels. I mean, you may want them to be about 10 inches, but that has to change a little according to the length of the wall, right? I mean, first you have to add up the styles and subtract the number of the sum of the styles from the length of the wall. Well, with this drawing, it's easy. You know there's eight styles. Let's say the styles are three inches wide. So eight times three equals 24. If we're working with a wall that's exactly eight feet, you subtract 24 inches from 96 and you get 72 inches. Even the most math mathematically challenged carpenter, and I'm talking about me, knows that if you're trying to use 10 inch panels, you only get seven of them into a 72 inch space. So you divide 72 by seven and you get something like 10 and two sevenths, right? I mean, if it's me, I'd just say sevenths are pretty close to eighths and two eighths is like a quarter. So I'd get out my tape measure. I mean, it's all guessing at this point anyway, right? You won't find out the exact panel size until you lay out the styles and the panels on the wall. We all know that. Here, I'll show you what I mean. We'll use this piece of one by six. It's exactly eight feet long. And we'll pretend this is an eight foot wall. Some of you have attended road shows have already seen this, so just play along for a minute, please. Here's what I used to do, and I bet a lot of you use the same technique. First, Mark a style with your tape measure. So we come across here, the styles are three inches, you mark a style. And then measure across for a panel. In this case, they're about ten and a quarter. So I'd take my tape measure, make a mark at ten and a quarter, and then move my tape measure over and mark for another style. Three inches. And then another panel. I mean, how many of you do this? Ten and a quarter. 
and keep working my way across the, right across the wall. By the time you get to the end of the wall, especially if it's a long wall, you realize you're off by a couple of inches, but that's no big deal because you expected that. I mean, you knew it was going to happen. You know the panel size is adjustable, not the styles, because they're all made from 1x4 or 1x3 or something. So you adjust the panel size a little. Say you add an eighth or a sixteenth of an inch when you lay out the wall again. Since the marks are so close together, look, the style is going to be the same, three inches, but the panel, instead of being ten and a quarter, it's going to be ten and an eighth. So this second panel, you put a little circle around it, then you measure from that one three inches, and now you've got to start putting circles around everything. So you measure over another ten and an eighth, and we put a circle around that, and we work our way across the wall, and another three inches, Put a circle there, and another ten and an eighth. This takes some time, you can see. Oops, that's ten, so that was a mistake. It's really easy to make a mistake doing this, too. So we'll circle the right one. Anyway, I think you get the drift. By the time you get to the end of the wall, you're off by an inch or so. That's no big deal. You expected that to happen. You adjust the size of the panels again. You start over, and this time, you draw a square around your mark. So instead of 10 and an eighth, you go 10 and a sixteenth. And things are getting kind of tight, but you can still get your little square in there. And this time, we're gonna come across three inches again. So we're right here. We'll put a little square around that one. And then we'll go 10 and a sixteenth. So we're just a little bit shy. And we're working our way across the wall. And you can imagine how long it takes to do a whole room like this. I mean, you put a lot of time into it. And by the time you get to the end of the wall, especially if it's a big room, you'd be off again. You could be off by another half an inch or three quarters of an inch. So what do you do? You come back to the beginning again. And this time, you draw a little triangle around your marks. And you mark across the wall, and you put a little triangle around it. And finally, if you're like me, and you want your panels right on, you take out a can of kills, you spray the whole thing out white, and you start over from scratch. Listen, I don't waste that kind of time anymore. Like I said, I use a high-tech tool for doing all the math, and it's called a calculator. First of all, let's eliminate one problem right from the top. How many of you are still doing this drawing, a drawing like this, to figure out how many styles? You can stop doing that right now. Trust me, there's always one more style than there are panels. Always. Look, you always start with a style, then a panel, then a style, then a panel, and so on. And when you get to the end, you always have to have one more style to finish the last panel. Yeah, I like to call that one the extra style. There's always going to be one extra style at the end or at the beginning, depending upon where you're counting from. And that's a rule you can count on because there's only one exception. A fellow that I met at a road show warned me about this, so I try to pass it on to everyone I can so you guys don't find yourself in the same situation. He drew me a little picture, too. If you're installing wainscoting in a round room, like this one here, and the room has no door, then there's an even number of styles and panels. But once you finish installing the paneling, especially if it goes all the way up to the ceiling, you can't get out of the room. So you always have one extra style. The first thing you do then is subtract that extra style from the length of the wall. That way, you have an even number of panels and styles, and you can divide the wall by that single number instead of having to add up the styles and subtract them from the length of the wall, then add up the panels and subtract them, etc. Like I said, I use a calculator, one with memory, one that has rise, run, and pitch functions. Here's how I use a calculator for laying out wainscoting. So you get a perfect layout the first time, a layout so close all the moldings can be cut with repetitive stops on your miter saw. I use a small calculator like this one when I'm in the field, but for this presentation, I'm going to be using this desktop model so we can all see it better. Let's keep working with this same 8-foot wall, just as an example. Then we'll lay out these walls, too. I've got the um, top rails and bottom rails already cut, and I've got them packaged and wrapped with blue tape so I don't get them confused or cut them for some other piece and have to cut them again. We've got a 96-inch wall here, and I'm going to use a flat back tape measure for this, too. It's a really useful layout tool to have in your shop. If I can stretch it across the board and it'll lay flat, whereas a regular tape measure 
when you stretch it, it curls. You can't get your pencil right to the board without having to flatten out the tape measure. And with a flat back tape, you don't have to worry about the curl on the tape measure. It lays flat right on the board. You'll see me using this throughout the layout process. Okay, if the styles are three inches wide, the first thing we want to do is run down to this end here and subtract three inches right off the end. It's 96 inches, so we'll put our mark here at 93. So I've got a mark right here at 93. This would be our last style from here to here, and I'll put a nice size mark there. So there's our last style. Now, by adding the style width to the desired panel width, and let's say we're using 10 inch panels, we can work with a single unit number. So if we've got three inch styles and the panels are exactly 10 inches, then we'd have a 13 inch unit number. Of course, the panels are never gonna end up exactly what you want them, but that's, that's where the wiggle room comes in. But we gotta start somewhere. So we're gonna do this math several times. So I like to enter the wall dimension into the memory. So the first thing I'm going to do with the calculator is we'll turn it on. And we've got 93 inches. So I'll punch in 93 inches. And I'm going to put that into the memory by punching the memory plus button. Then I'm going to hit the divide key. And then I'm going to enter 13 for the unit number. And I'll press the equals button. 7 and an eighth. See that? Well, you can't have seven and an eighth units. The number of panels and styles has to be even. But like I said, this is just the first step. Now we know we'll be using seven panels and styles. I mean, it's an uneven number, seven and an eighth. We could round it up to, we could round it down to seven or we could round it up to eight, but you know, seven is the closest. So instead of using eight panels, we use seven panels. That's the closest we can get to this. So let's clear the calculator. So we'll just push the clear button once but we still have that little memory showing, that little M showing in the, in the um, viewer here. So we know that the wall dimension is still in memory. So to get the wall dimension back, all I have to do is press recall once and memory plus, and it'll bring that dimension right back up into the calculator. And this time we're going to divide by seven. So I'll press the division key and press the number seven and press enter. 13 and 5 sixteenths, that's the quotient, or the result. Now let's talk about this number for a second. Watch what happens when I divide 93 by 7 without pushing the inch button. So I'm going to clear the calculator. I'm going to press 93 and divide by 7, and I get 13.28571. That's the beauty of this calculator. When you press the inch button, you're telling the calculator to round off to the nearest sixteenth of an inch, but it's really using this decimal fraction. I'll show you what I mean. We'll hit control. Let me clear everything. We'll hit recall and memory plus and bring the 93 inches back, and we'll divide by 7 and press the equals button, and we'll get 13 and 5 sixteenths. That number isn't exact. In fact, if you cut a stick of wood that's 13 and 5 sixteenths long and try to use it as a gauge block and stepped off the wall, I mean, stepped it off with that gauge block, by the time you got to the corner, you could be off by an inch. That's uh, called cumulative error. Have you ever had that problem when you're doing stairs? Like when you take a, a framing square and you step off a stringer and you're running up the stringer and all of a sudden you get to the top and you're off by a half an inch? That's cumulative error. The calculator will solve your problems without cumulative error. It rounds off that crazy decimal fraction to the nearest sixteenth of an inch. So you can't use a gauge block. You have to step off each site location, each style location, using the calculator. Let's lay out all these styles across the rail and you'll see what happens. The first style is going to be at the end. So I've got my three inch mark right here and I'll mark below the tape measure so we don't get confused by these old marks. So here's the first style right here. When I pull my tape measure, it's to 13 and 15 sixteenths, which is right up here. Where am I measuring to? I'm measuring from the tape, from the back of the style to the back of the style. So the next style is right here. I mark an X and go. So the idea is mark and go, mark and go. To find the next panel layout, I press the plus button once and then the equals button to add the number that's in memory to itself. So the next layout is 26 and 9 sixteenths. 
So I come up to 26 and 9 16 right to here, and it's mark and go, right? So there's my next style. Now, here's where it gets a little tricky. To find the next layout line, I won't press the plus button again. I only do that the first time. If I did that now, I'd be telling the calculator to add 26 and 9 16 to itself, and I'd lose the decimal fraction, that 13.28571, that's automatically in the memory. So from now on, I just press the equals button down here. I'll press it once right now, and it'll add that number that's in memory to this, fun to this sum. So the next layout is 39 and 7 eighths. Let me come on up here to 39 and 7 eighths. We're right here now. And I'll put an X up that mark. Hey, look, we're back into eighths. Did you notice that? I'm going to press the equals button again, and we'll get 53 and an eighth. So I'm going to come up to 53 and an eighth and put an X right there. I don't know if you noticed or not, but it's rounding off a sixteenth of an inch, almost a sixteenth of an inch each time. It's really rounding off 30 seconds. Watch, I'm going to press this next one, and it's 66 and 7 sixteenths. I mean, we should have stayed in eighths or gone into quarters, but it went back to sixteenths. So let me mark this one, 66 and 7 sixteenths. So there's our X there. And one more, 79 and 11 sixteenths. We'll mark that one right here. And I'll push the equals button one last time. 93 inches, right on the nose. Hey, if a calculator doesn't earn its keep for you, I don't know what will. This thing's right on the button every single time, right at the back of the last style. Try doing that with a tape measure. And try getting all the panel sizes to within a sixteenth of an inch of each other. Okay, so, so far you're with me. That means we can move into something a bit more complex, and that means another set of rules. So far, we've been laying out all the styles as if they're all the same size, three and a half inches, and that's okay. I've installed a lot of wainscoting without compensating for overlapping styles on inside corners, and those jobs look just fine. Some carpenters believe that any time you put two styles together for an inside corner or an outside corner, the added width of the combined pieces makes it difficult to see the difference between the corner styles and the field styles but a sharp eye can see the difference. If you're working in a high-end home, or if you're just a carpenter that likes to be more precise, here's a really simple system you can use that will keep all the styles pretty much the same size. The earlier rules we talked about for measuring frame lengths, they apply to this system too. The frame lengths never change, it's just the style sizes. For this method, you just change the width of your inside corner styles. To keep your styles the same size, Follow these two simple rules. Always use half inch wider styles on all inside corners. And second rule is always use field size styles on all outside corners and any end that butts up against a casing or a bookcase or some, or some kind of built in or something like that. Let me show you how these two rules work. Let's start with this first frame in this animated room. The right end butts against the casing, so we'd use a three and a half inch style on that end. To get a tight fitting joint, you may have to scribe a little off that style, kind of like I did off the casing in the room a few minutes ago. Maybe up to a quarter of an inch even, at the most. But you won't notice that difference in the size of the styles. On the left end of the frame, we use a four inch style, because the next frame is three quarters of an inch thick, and it'll cover about a half inch of this end. A little less if you scribe an eighth to a quarter off the casing end. Remember the measurement rules. For inside corner to inside corner and inside corner to casing frames, you always subtract a quarter of an inch from the wall measurement. By the time you squeeze the right style tight against the casing and put the second frame on top of the left style, all four styles will be within a quarter of an inch of each other. Like I said, the second frame has an inside corner on the right, so we install a 4-inch style on that end. Why? Because we'll have to scribe a half inch off that frame just to get it on the wall. Even though we made the next frame a quarter inch short, with the first frame in place, it's now a half inch too long. 
So we scribe that half inch off this style, and that's what balances the style exposure on both sides of the corner. The second frame is an inside corner to inside corner frame too, so it gets four inch styles on both ends. The third frame has an inside corner on the right and an outside corner on the left. We use a four inch style on the right side and a three and a half inch style on the left side. And we add a half inch to this frame size so we'll have enough material to make up the outside corner after scribing a half inch off the four inch style on the right. The fourth frame has a three and a half inch style on the right and a four inch style on the left because that's also an inside corner to an outside corner frame. We make it a half inch longer than the measurement. That way we have enough material to make up the corner in either direction, just in case you wanted the rabbit joint to face the other way. Each of the remaining frames follows the same rules. We're going to use those rules right here in this room. So you're going to get the information a couple of different ways. From me talking too much, from the drawings, from making the frames themselves, one way or the other. I want you to learn that if you follow these basic rules, or learn enough to make up some of your own, you can have some real fun and make some really good money installing wainscoting. Now let's do some real layout. The first thing we have to do is find out how many panels we'll be installing and what exact size they'll be. Here's the top and ra bottom rails for the frame that's going to go on the wall underneath the window over here. I'm going to put the top rail up near me so the top of the frame's here and that'll make the right side the right side and the left side the left side. They measure 94 and 3 quarters which is exactly the, what we got from our measurement with the laser. This frame needs to have a three and a half inch style on the right where it butts up against the casing and a four inch style on the left where it goes into a corner. So the first thing we have to do is eliminate that extra style so that we can do the math. And if we're going to eliminate a style, let's make it the 4-inch style. Because that way we don't have to worry about doing anything that's really head-scratching, you know? Some kind of special layout because we got a 4-inch style in it. We'll just eliminate the 4-inch style right off the bat. So I'll put a little X right here, and we'll know that's our 4-inch style. Then all we have to do is measure back to it. So we'll pull a measurement. Great, we got 90 and 3 quarters right on. So I'm going to write that on the back of the rail here. We'll put 90 and 3 quarters right there. Now, if I take the calculator and I enter 90 and 3 quarters, I enter that sum into the calculator. That's 90 inches and three quarters. And I'm going to press the memory plus button so it's entered into memory. And that way we can play with that number and figure out exactly the panel size we want. If the styles are three and a half inches wide and we want a panel that's roughly 12 inches wide, we're working with a 15 and a half inch unit. One style and one panel together equals 15 and a half inches. So all we have to do is divide this 90 and 3 quarters by 15 and a half. All I have to do is press the divide button and enter 15 inches and 1 half and press the equals button and we got 5.8. 5.485839 something whatever. Well, you can't have an uneven number of units. It has to be an even number. The first calculation, like I said earlier, is always it's always necessary so you can figure out exact number of units. This is pretty close to 6, so let's just start by rounding up to 6. All we have to do is enter the wall length again. I have that number in memory, so all I have to do is press the clear button a couple of times, then press recall memory plus and that'll bring up the wall length again and divide that number by 6. So I'll press the divide button and hit the 6 key and press equals and we get 15 and an eighth. Listen, don't expect to get this the first time. Like I said, we're going to run through these calculations several times. Some of you are going to be pretty bored, but I want to make sure that everybody understands this. Trust me, by the time I'm finished here, everybody will. With a 15 and an eighth inch unit size, the panels will be slightly under 12 inches. Subtract three and a half and you can see the panels will be about 11 and three quarters. But what if the unit size comes out much smaller than the panel size you're aiming for? 
With a calculator, it's easy to check out what happens if you use five panels. First, press the on-off button a couple of times just to clear the display. The number in memory stays there until you press the recall button twice. Once the display is clear, press the recall button and then the memory plus button and you'll get the wall dimension and just divide that. So we'll press the divide key by five and press the equals button and we got 18 and an eighth. The unit size would be 18 and an eighth, so the panel size would be close to 15 inches, much bigger than we wanted. Here's a piece of advice. Never get stuck on a specific panel size. You always have to make some kind of compromise or adjustment from the panel size you first choose. But the real compromise isn't just about the perfect panel size on one wall. When you're laying out panel sizes, you have to see the whole picture. Sometimes you have to pick a narrower panel size or a wider one if you're working on different length walls in one room. I like to end up with an average panel size that's within an inch or two all the way around a room. I think getting within an inch or two on panel sizes is plenty close enough and not many people are going to notice the difference. And now's the time to figure your options before you assemble any frames. Let's look at this next wall. It's too bad the differences between these two walls aren't, isn't greater. I mean, they're within nine inches of each other, but you'll get the point. Let me bring in the frames for the next wall. There we go. And then we're going to want to take both of these frames and do them the same way. Here's the back. So we'll lay the back up. So all of our layout marks will be on the back of the material. And in this case, this frame is going to go on the wall right behind me. So what I think I'm going to do is I'll put the top rail on the top here and the bottom rail on the bottom. And that way, the left side is the left side and the right side is the right side. First, I press recall twice to clear the memory. And then I'll clear the display too. That wall measured 104 and a quarter, so I cut the top and bottom rails 103 and a quarter. Remember, I allowed for a three quarter inch back band and subtracted an additional quarter inch for an inside corner frame. Okay, so let's take the inside corner on this one is over here, so we'll measure back from this corner four inches for that inside corner. And then we'll pull a tape across here. Great. The measurement on this one's 99 and a quarter inches right on the nose. I'm going to enter that into the calculator. So I'll press 99 inches and one quarter and I'll press memory plus right here so it's entered into the calculator. I'm going to write that number on the back of this rail too. I'll write 99 and a quarter inches just in case we lose the number or something. Now I'm going to divide that number by 6. So we're going to press the divide button and then 6 and we get 16 and 9 sixteenths. That's without the style. Without the styles we'd have about a 13 inch panel. That's almost within an inch of the other panels. But what happens if we use 7 panels instead of 6 on this wall? All we have to do is press the clear button, press recall memory and divide by 7. And that way, the unit size would be 14 and 3 16 So the panel would be almost 11 inches. And that's pretty close, too. I could go either way. I think the room would look better if both walls had an equal number of panels. Since they're close, they, they should they may as well be the same. Besides, if I make six panels on this wall, I won't have to cut so many pieces. Before we jump off that cliff, let's look a little further. Let's look at all the walls. We'll go back to the pop-out here because we didn't look at that. Here's the, the narrow side over here. And remember, it measured 11 and 3 eighths inches. If we subtract 7 and a half inches for both styles, remember, the style on the right side here is going to be 4 inches wide, and the style will be 3 and a half. This panel is going to end up being 7 inches wide. Pretty narrow, huh? I think narrow panels look kind of cool, though, on pop-outs, especially like this one. In fact, they look a lot better than putting like a solid piece of board right there. That really looks bad. Personally, I'd put in a panel as narrow as two inches. I mean, depending on the panel molding and the type of panel being used, I'm going to be putting in flat panels into these frames. So seven inches is just fine. But a little later, I'll show you another way to treat a pop-out like this. 
Now let's look at this side over here. The top and bottom rails for this side measure 21 and 5 eighths, which means the panel will be almost 14 inches wide. That's a lot wider than the panels on this wall underneath the window. Remember, they were going to be around 12 inches. It's a good thing we looked at these two walls. I probably should have checked out those panels first. Well, finish work isn't really fun unless you learn something new every day, right? And I just learned something new in my own studio. This room is going to look best if I put six panels on this longer wall so the pop-out doesn't look out of place. So I'm going to write down on this longer wall, here's the longer one, I'll write down six right here and put a circle around it. Now, I'm going to put five panels under the window here. So I'm going to write down five on a shorter wall. We'll put a circle around that. If I put five panels on this wall over here, you know what that means, don't you? It means I'll have to cut fewer pieces. Can you see the power in this calculator? The calculator allows you to see a lot farther ahead. It allows you to see the whole picture, and that's pretty much what layout's all about. Eliminating the cost and aggravation of rework. If you don't see the whole picture before you start a job, you'll end up seeing it after you finish, and you might not be happy with what you see. Your clients might not be too happy either. Remember, if you're doing finish work, it's got to be fun. High-tech tools make jobs a lot more profitable, and that tends to make them a lot more fun too. Okay, let's lay out the exact styles on these rails now. I made the top rail from 1x4 and the bottom rail from 1x6 so there's enough room for baseboard to go on top of the bottom rail. In fact, you can make the styles even shorter if your base is really tall and bring the bottom rail up off the floor, then just fill in behind it, underneath it, you know, behind where the base goes, with whatever you backing you need. The backing can be anything, even MDF, which is a lot less expensive than using, say, really nice clean Windsor 1 1x for a bottom rail. So we got the rails, we got the rails down here. We'll measure across. And this layout here is 90 and 3 quarter inches. Remember, we've already taken all these measurements. So I'm going to enter the 90 inches and 3 quarters. And I'm going to divide that, in this case, by 5. That's the number we wrote down here on the rail. And we get 18 and an eighth. So that's our first layout mark. So I'll come across here to 18 and an eighth, and I'll make a little mark with an X. Now the next one, remember, I want to press the plus button and then the equals button and we're going to get 36 and 5 sixteenths. So I'll come up to 36 and 5 sixteenths and I'll make a mark right there. And we'll put an X right there too. Now we're going to come up and we're just going to press the equals button. Not the plus button, just the equals button. We'll get 54 and 7 sixteenths. So I'm going to make that mark right here now. 54 and 7 sixteenths. We want to press the equals button one more time there. 72 and 5 eighths. So we'll come up here to 72 and 5 eighths. It's right where I wrote the number 5, but we've got enough room to put it in here, right there. And one more time, I'll press the equals button, 90 and 3 quarters. So we're right at the end, exactly at the back of the last style. Perfect. And that finishes the layout. Almost. There's one other thing I want to do. I want to flush these ends up. And this is just like framing a wall. I want to transfer these lines now straight across from the top rail to the bottom rail and get some good X's on here too. So I'm going to have really visible lines on here and I'm going to know exactly which side of the line every style goes on. And we'll do this one too. And right on across to the end and this one I've got to measure over three and a half because we got a three and a half inch style on this end. And that's it. Now we're ready to lay out the next set. So we'll move those out of the way and now we'll lay out the second one. Remember, on this set, we subtracted for a three-quarter inch back band too, so the length of the rail 
minus the last style is 99 and a quarter inches. And we wrote the number right here. And we also wrote down that we're gonna have six units on this wall. So all we have to do is divide, let me clear this calculator and clear the old memory number. All we have to do is enter 99 and a quarter, 99 inches and one slash quarter, and divide that by six, and we'll get our first measurement line. It's 16 and 9 sixteenths. So I'll come across on this one, and I'll measure 16 and 9 sixteenths, so we're right here. Put a little X there so we know which side of the line we want to go on. And I'll push the plus button once and the equals button once, and we'll get 33 and a sixteenth. So that's going to put us right here with an X on the far side of the line. And now we just push the equals button. We have 49 and 5 eighths with an X on the left side of it. And the equals button again, 66 and 3 sixteenths, 66 and 3 sixteenths. And once more, 82 and 11 sixteenths. And the last time, 99. Excellent, and a quarter. We're perfect. So this one's ready now too. I'm gonna transfer these lines. Make sure these are flush. And transfer these lines across. And make sure we have good X's on those as well. Otherwise, trust me, I will put a style on the wrong side of the measurement line every single time at least once per frame. And this one we've got to measure back three and a half as well, because it's going to butt right up against the casing here. So we'll draw our line and we'll put our X on both sides of that too. And that's the end of it. We're ready to assemble these things. The only type of frame that we're missing in this room is an inside corner to inside corner wall. Laying out those frames is a little bit trickier, so I'd really be remiss if I didn't include one in this program. Let's look at this piece again, this piece of one by six that's eight feet long. Let's say we have an eight foot wall with inside corners on both ends. That means we have to put a four inch style on both ends. Now, How do you do the math for that? I mean, how can you make even units and eliminate a style and eliminate both styles. Really, it's the same technique we've already been using with a little twist. First, we'll eliminate this last style. I'll come up to this end. I'll mark four inches for that style and we can draw a line across there as well. And then I'm going to measure back to that line. And to do that, I'm going to allow an additional half inch on this end for that four inch style. So I'm going to cheat. I'm going to pretend that this board is actually a half inch shorter than it really is. Instead of doing some math and burning an inch or something, and since I lay out these kind of walls so frequently, I made this little measuring jig and it's real simple. It's just a piece of quarter inch plywood. It measures exactly an inch and a half wide. And then I cut two strips that are exactly a half inch and laminated one strip on each edge, one on the top, one on the bottom. And I also fired a few little pins through this. I fired some pins through this edge right back here, and then I clipped them off on this end. So you can take this little jig and slip. I know this seems really silly, but this is the only way I know how to do the math real quick. You take this little jig and slip it onto the end there, and just give it a push and those pins will dig in. And you can take a tape measure and hook right onto there, and you'll be burning a half an inch off this board. So you don't have to make any measurements. You don't have to worry about, you know, your tape measure slipping or burning an inch on your tape measure and then using the wrong measurement. So I'm going to pull all the way over now to the mark I made and it's 91 and a half inches. I use simple techniques to protect myself from making major math errors and pretending that this style down here is three and a half inches is just a safety net. Since I can't hook my tape measure on either end of the board, that's why I use the little jig. It's easier and a lot more accurate than driving in a finish nail, and it's definitely a lot more accurate, like I said, than burning an inch between you, off your tape measure. Before we walk away from this rail, I want to make sure that you all realize that this flat back tape measure should really win a prize. I've fought with stiff tape measures enough, 
you know, try doing some of the stuff we've been doing with a stiff tape measure, and every time you tip the tape, you know, to get it close to the wood, the hook will slip off. For laying out anything in your shop, this tape really sings. You can put marks right on it, too. You can use it as a story pole and put a mark right on it, and then later on, you can erase the mark right off the tape. Like I said, I'm not trying to sell you stuff on this program. I'm only trying to show you some of the new tools that are out there. And hey, this isn't the only tape measure I use. I use both of them, just like I use a tape measure and a laser distance measuring tool. Different tools for different techniques for different times. So hey, check this out. So the number we want to work with is 91 and a half inches. We'll put that number into memory. 91 inches and one half and we'll divide that number by six divided by six equals fifteen and a quarter that's the second mark so the first one's at fifteen and a quarter and the second one we're gonna do plus equals the second one's at thirty and a half and then we'll do equals for the rest of them forty five and three quarters and equals again 61 and again 76 and a quarter and then the last one 91 and a half so these styles in this layout this panel layout here will be just perfect even with the four inch styles we'll end up with 11 and three quarter inch clear panels in each opening if you want to check you can go back to the first one and you can lay these out just by pulling your four inch mark and measuring across to the panel. And it's 11 and three quarters. And remember, this is now a three and a half inch style. We'll measure to the next panel and it's dead on 11 and three quarters. Now let's get out of this math class and do some carpentry. When you're making repetitive cuts at your miter saw for styles and stuff like this, you've got to use a repetitive stop system of some kind. That's one of the reasons I really feel that when you're using a miter saw, you need to use continuous extension wings. The wings I have here I built myself, and I made this uh, repetitive stop system out of some Craig jig. Craig Tool Parts from Craig Tool Company, their T-Track and their Miter Track. It works really well. I have another um, extension wing system for my miter saw that many of you have seen me use. It's made by Saw Helper. It's over in the corner here. You can see the aluminum um, wings sitting in the corner over there. I use that one mostly when I go out on job sites or when I travel because it's absolutely indestructible. And if other people use it, I don't have to worry about them hurting it. This one I spent a lot of time making here in my shop and I don't want it to get damaged, so I pretty much keep it at home. There's a couple other things I want to talk about here. If you don't use a repetitive stop system at your miter saw when you're cutting styles like this, you'll be using your tape measure to measure each and individual piece. You'll be making mistakes. There's just no way to avoid it. You know, you'll, your pencil might slip a little bit. You might be cutting pieces off by a sixteenth of an inch or so. You'll be just 
testing your patience. When you're making styles for wainscoting and the chair rails all at the same height, you have to use a repetitive stop so that all the molding pieces that you cut down the line, all the panel molding that goes inside the panels is exactly the same size too. So it's really, really important to set up a system like this. And you know, once you set these up, you can hand this off to one of your guys and have them cut 100 or 200 styles for you while you're laying something else out. And while I'm here, take a look at this. This is something new. This is from FastCap2. And like I said, they're a, a very innovative company if I haven't said it already. This is a brand new hood that they've just come up with for sliding compound miter saws. You can see that my saw clears no matter which way I swing it in here. Now this isn't vacuum activated. I still got a vacuum hose for my dust collection system right on the back of the miter saw. But you can tell how much dust these vacuum hoses pick up. I mean, most sliding compound miter saws, the vacuum hose in the system just is not efficient at all. They're just not effective. You can tell by all the dust that's in this hood back here. All the dust just collects in the inside of the hood, falls down through the bottom, and I get it all into this cardboard box underneath the saw where I throw my small scrap pieces too. So it's a really handy little thing to have. If you want to take it to a job site, you just disconnect it from the holes in the back of your miter saw. The whole thing collapses real quick. You just drop one of these up, one of them down, one of them up, and you can fold this up in a second and take it out to a job site or something. I, I can't say enough about these, especially when you're working on a job site. If you've ever had pieces fly out the back of your saw and come close to hitting somebody else in the eye, this is a great way to protect some of the other people working on your job. And in a shop environment, there's no dust collecting now on any of my other stuff that's right by my saw, which is a first for me. I've had nothing but trouble with dust in my workshops, and I'm really glad to finally be getting some control over it. So now that we got all of these pieces cut, Let's cut some pocket holes in these. Pocket screws, especially portable pocket screw jigs, have revolutionized wainscoting and made it much less expensive to install. You no longer have to glue up frames and secure them with long bar clamps, then wait for the glue to dry. And you don't have to use biscuits or splines, except in some situations, which we'll get to later. This is a Craig pocket hole jig. It costs about 150 bucks. Take my advice. If you don't own one of these already, just go out and buy one right now. You can use one of these for so many things, not just face frames. I use pocket screws to assemble nosings on mantel shelves like this one. So I could fasten the shelf nosing with pocket screws. I designed this mantel with two top shelves. The first shelf is secured directly to the tops of the pilasters from above. The finished top shelf is fastened from beneath the subshelf. Using pocket screws and a Craig bench clamp, I was able to install the nosings on the top shelf perfectly flush, without any fasteners showing. The pilasters have no exposed fasteners either. They're fastened with pocket screws from the inside. Using pocket screws is much better than nailing. You can clamp the wood together, and down the road, none of the joinery moves. I use pocket screws for assembling cabinets, for cabinet face frames, definitely any time I'm working with MDF, for all kinds of stuff. Let me show you how this works. You take the back of the molding, and this is where it says prime, prime by Windsor 1, so you want the back of the molding up against the bushing, and then I just clamp that into place. And if you want to secure this, you can take a clamp This is Festool's quick clamp. You just have to slide it up against the bottom of the work table and then just squeeze the handle. And it'll tighten itself up real good. And now we've got it fairly secure. From the back here, I'm going to guide this step bit, it's a pocket hole bit, into the bushing and drill a couple of pocket holes. Then I'll pull the piece out, flip it over, and I'm going to have to do this to every style. There's a vacuum attachment that comes with this jig too. So you can hook up a dust collector to this and pick up all of the dust right off the back of it. You can see these are the pocket holes that you're going to drill. Trust me, if you buy one of these, you'll never regret it.
There's actually three bushings in this jig right here. There's two that are real close together here. And you can use these two right here if you're using like a two inch style. Or like I am with this three and a half style here, I'm using these two outer holes. I'm just centering up the style right in the jig. And drill in the holes. This does take a little bit of time. You know, once you do a lot of wainscoting and you drill enough of these pocket holes, you're going to probably want to get something else. You're going to want to get one of these. Once you've drilled 50 or 60,000 pocket holes with a Craig pocket hole jig, the manual one, you can graduate to the Craig Foreman and really speed up production. All you have to do with this tool is slide your board in with the prime side down, slide it up against a stop, the bit comes up out of the bottom of the machine automatically as soon as you pull the handle. Then you just have to flip your board around. And I can drill through these very quickly. In a fraction of the time that it takes to run that little Craig pocket hole jig and get perfectly clean pocket holes every time. This tool is definitely worth investing in if you're doing high-end finish work or if you're doing just a lot of mantel pieces and cabinets and wainscoting. Craig also makes a tool that's just like this but it's air powered. But for most finished carpenters it's too big to drag around to the job site. Once all the holes are drilled, there are several methods you can use to assemble the face frames. If you're working on a small frame, a Craig clamp is definitely the way to go. These are pretty useful. I've seen carpenters assemble frames right on the floor with these, right next to the wall where they're installed, where the frames are installed, and all they use is one of these plates. I mounted mine to a piece of plywood so it's easier to grab it. I rabbited that plywood a little bit so when it's on the floor it's easier to pick it up. I found I could barely get this thing off the floor unless I had the Craig clamp in it and then you can pick it up easily. Pick up a copy of Craig Tool Company's Pocket Hole DVD and you'll see Gary Striegler using the same technique, that exact technique, to insert, to uh, install wainscoting on walls, assembling the wainscoting right on the floor. I think I must be a lot older than Gary Either that or I'm just too tired to bend over and work on the ground all the time. My knees hurt too much. The floor stuff really kills me. And this steel plate, it gets heavy. Craig also has a smaller plate, one that you can mount into a piece of plywood if you want, like I've done right here. And then you can drop the whole thing onto your workbench and you can mount your Craig clamp right into that. And you could carry this with you anywhere you want. Or now be careful with this one. You can mount a Craig clamp right into your Festool MFT table. Just don't let Festool find out you did it. I mounted mine right here in this position because it doesn't interfere with the angle guide or anything with the MFT table. But you have to be careful because the plate could interfere with the table. These single position plates and clamps aren't nearly as fast as an assembly table, you know, a full size assembly table that you'd want to use for a big frame. Because with a big frame, you really need to move around quickly. But let me show you how this works. You just slide the Craig clamp into the, into the plate. You take your two pieces. Let me grab one of these styles. 
and you just butt the pieces together and slide. You want to put a little glue into this joint too. I'll talk more about that in a minute. And take your clamp and just tighten it up on there. And I could put a little bit more pressure on there. And you want to put the clamp right on top of the pocket hole screw itself. And I'm going to flush up this back edge here and hold it with my thumb. And I'll grab a screw gun here and a couple of pocket screws. And we'll run one of them in right here. That's it. You can see it tightening up just as we got up to the shoulder of the hole. And I'll move this and clamp down in the second position. And we'll put another pocket hole screw right into this hole. And that's it. That's all you have to do. This is a perfectly flush joint. I mean, I'd say 95% of the time, all they need is like 220 sandpaper. Every now and then you get one that isn't just quite right. You can always loosen the screws and check it real quick and get it flush on a second try. Because I don't use this Craig clamp for everything. Like I said, when I'm doing big tables and stuff, big, sorry, big wainscoting, big panels, I use an assembly table. I made my first assembly table after watching an early video that Craig Tool Company made. The table looks something like this. It was just a sheet of plywood with 1x4 uprights, pocket screwed every 16 inches or so. On job sites, we use assembly tables like this one made from full 8-foot sheets of plywood so we can assemble large frames. In a shop, though, something that size is just too awkward to store. You can also make another type of assembly table, one that's more portable. Marco Fee, a frequent contributor to the JLC Live Finnish Carpentry Forum, designed and built this setup with hollow box beams. He cut a piece of plywood that inserts into the middle of the table where he mounted a Craig clamp. All of the box beams nest inside of each other so it's easy to transport and store the table. A few years ago, I started using a table made by EasySmart. I liked the table because the uprights were adjustable, they slid in and out on plastic guides, and the uprights on each end swiveled too so that the 24 by 48 inch footprint of the table could expand to support a full sheet of plywood. I also liked the table because the uprights could be moved out of the way easily or brought to bear right under the area I was working on. But the plastic guides didn't last long on a job site. My guys snapped those things and broke them really fast. If you're careful with the EC Smart system, it's not bad, though the uprights do sag a little bit when they're fully extended. Those sagging uprights really got to me. I wanted an expandable table, one that was lightweight, took up very little room when stored, but had a durable sliding upright system. I got together with Greg Burnett, another JLC, JLC contributor, and we designed this table. We used Craig Tool's aluminum track, their mini track and their miter track, and we screwed the mini track to a 24 inch, in this case it's about oh, 50 inch long piece of plywood. The six inside tracks, two, four, and six, slide directly out of the table in this direction and there's stops on them so you can run them all the way out without having to worry about running them off the track. But the four outer uprights, these two and these two, I only fastened those in the very center because I wanted those to swivel. I wanted them to pivot right in the middle. That way I can take this one and swing it all the way out and tighten that down and between the two of them, once I swivel this one out too, I can pick up enough swing here to support a good eight foot sheet. You'll see me using this throughout the rest of the program for assembling these frames. The uprights are made from two inch stock. And then I cut a notch in them right in here so I could install a star knob and a quarter inch T-bolt, which locks the upright down into the mini track. A piece of miter track screwed to the bottom of all of these, all of these uprights is what guides the upright on the mini track. You can tighten the screws that, it, that secure the miter track to the bottom of the upright and when you do you'll get an even tighter fit on the T-track. We topped off each upright with a sacrificial piece of one by one secured with a domino tenon at each end and I'll show you how to do that a little later so that it's really easy to remove each piece. I put one screw in the top and countersunk it really deep just in case I've cut through here with my saw I don't want to run into that drywall screw. This table is great for ripping sheet goods which I'll show you once we get 
out of these frames and we're cutting panels. The table also works really well for doing glue ups, for making wide solid panels, which I'll show you later when we want to make some solid panels for making raised panels. And of course, all this hardware, the T-track, the, the mini-track, the knobs, not to mention the wood, it isn't cheap to make one of these. But it's a dream for assembling frames. You're going to see what I mean when I start using it. Of course, there's one other method you can use for assembling frames, but it's not very portable and it's definitely not job site friendly. Craig Tool Company makes a face frame and pneumatic table, which is the way to go if you're working in a cabinet shop making frames all the time. Whatever assembly table you have, make sure you clamp it securely to your work table or you're going to have a big problem on your hands. You don't want that frame slipping off along with the assembly table right in the middle of attaching it. There we go. Now I can extend out all of these arms in all directions and get ready to support my face frame. So we want to position this just the way we did when we laid it out. And what we did was we made the, this the top, so the right end is the right end and the left end is the left end, so this corner is the one that gets the four inch styles. Using pocket screws is really pretty simple. Just be sure you've got the right screws. And I've read articles where carpenters say it isn't necessary to glue pocket hole joints. I kind of feel another layer of security doesn't hurt and only takes a second or two to spread some glue. We'll get to that in just a second. Let me get some more styles up here. These are the three inch styles and then we're going to need a four inch style at this end down here. And I'll start with this end because this is the one that's going to butt up against that casing right there. And I'll just bring these rails up so that the style is sitting across both of them and supporting itself. And I'll bring in another Craig clamp. This is the clamp I use when I'm assembling on a, an assembly table. I can take this clamp and it has a really wide jaw on the bottom. You can see how wide and large this washer head is on the bottom and a smaller one on the top. You want to have the big wide one on the bottom face of the material so you get more pressure on the face and you'll get a more flush joint because you'll be distributing the pressure of the clamp more evenly. And I'm going to put this clamp right on top of the pocket hole screw and first I'm going to make sure that I've got a nice flush end right here. And the pressure on there feels pretty good but I think I'll tighten that up just a little more just by turning this knob back here. You can see I've got some blue masking tape on here and that's on there just to stop that uh, bolt from working its way in or out while I'm using the wrench because if it slides out any then the clamp won't have the right amount of pressure on the joint. So now that I've got the clamp on there I can run a pocket screw in there and oh I forgot the glue. Let me put a little glue on that joint too. This is a glue bottle called a glue bot from FastCap. This is another product FastCap makes. And this one I really like too, it's kind of cute. It has a vacuum chamber right here at the very front of the glue bottle. So when you apply the glue, you sque squeeze the glue chamber in the back and the vacuum chamber pushes the glue up through the spout like this. You can see it comes right up out of there, even if the bottle's vertical like this. And the cool thing is, when the glue comes up like this, when you let go, it draws the remainder of the glue right back down inside of the spout. So the tip never clogs, at least very rarely. So I've got a little bit of glue on here. I'll spread some across this joint. You want to glue up all these joints because it's just a good habit to develop. You know, when you install stain grade work, you've got to seal the end grain of the styles. Otherwise, the stain can creep inside the joint and be drawn up into the end grain and darken the joint more than the surrounding wood. Let me just slip this in here and put this clamp on. And once again, I'll put the clamp right on top of the screw hole and clamp it down. Same thing happens, you know, with miters and casing and crown and baseboard and chair rail. If you don't glue up both sides of the miter, you're going to get stain creeping right inside. Even if you book match all of your 
material and you cut really tight miters, that stain will creep around the corners and darken up the miters and your work, work won't look nearly as nice. I'll move that clamp onto the second screw hole there. So I'm putting pressure directly above the screw. And now it's much easier for me. I left this leg of the style on top of the other rail. I can slide this rail back, squeeze a little bit of glue onto this style first. Oop, a little messy there. And then pull this style down into place. I want to be sure that these joints are flush on the back. And I'll run up a couple of pocket hole screws into this one too. You noticed how that screw pushed these apart as I was driving the screw in. It's perfectly cool. That happens frequently, sometimes if you don't have quite enough pressure on your clamp. But the clamp will still hold those two pieces referenced together so they'll be flush when the joint draws up. And this joint right here isn't even tight. There's a gap right here. But when I draw this screw in here, it's gonna, when I drive the screw in, boom, it just drew both of these up. But look, I didn't have the clamp over that screw and I should have. This piece isn't perfectly flush now. So I'm gonna back this out. You get a second try here if you use that clamp properly. I'm gonna back that out, put the clamp directly over that and run the screw in a second time. It may go into the same hole, but the joint will be flush when I'm done. There we go. I mean, what could be better than that? I mean, you can make a mistake and still get it right. Let's put the second one in. And this time, I'll take this and glue both ends. We spread glue across there. Now same over here. We've got one end that goes into here and one into this side. Now I'm going to push this over a little so this style will end up sitting on the upright just a little bit and it'll support it. So it's on this, on this outrigger upright right here. And on this end, I don't need the upright. Now watch this. This is where the assembly table really comes in handy. I can take the clamp, I can slip it underneath the joint and put it anywhere I want on this style so I can get a clamp onto the style from any direction and run a screw in right where I need it. It looks like that first one is a little bit crooked so I'm gonna run that one in again. First I'll put this joint, this screw in. You can hear the clutch and gauge on this driver too. You want to use a pretty sensitive drill motor when you're doing this. I used to use an impact driver. There we go. I used to use an impact driver, but it just doesn't have enough sensitivity and you can strip the screws really easily with an impact driver. You want to have a screw gun that has a lot of sensitivity, a lot of torque, but a lot of sensitivity and a really good, a really good um, clutch on it so it'll cut off before you put too much torque on a joint. Now I can reach over from this direction and make sure I put that big end of this clamp underneath the material and I'll run a screw in right underneath that clamp and I'm right on the line so we're I haven't made that mistake where I put the style on the wrong side of the line yet it's pretty hard to do when you have these great big X's so that is the second style. Now I'm ready to move off to the end. I want to do the end before I fill in the rest of these field styles. Remember, this is a four inch style on this corner. It's got to be four inches across because it's an inside corner. And we're going to take this style and we're going to rip it down here. We're going to scribe this style all the way down, all the way across the rails to fit into the inside corner. So if we're going to do that, I don't want to put this screw in. If I put this screw in and I have to scribe this piece off, I could run into the screw with my saw, and I don't want to do that. So I'm going to leave these two end screws out. I'd like to reinforce this joint with something else, 
And what I'm going to do is I'm going to reinforce it with a domino. This tool uses five different sizes of tenons. They're actually called dominoes. A 10 by 50 and an 8 by 50, they're the same length but different thicknesses. And then an 8 by 40 and a 6 by 40, which are also the same length but different thicknesses. And then the 5 by 30, which is the smallest domino. And that's the one I use most often in miters and wainscoting and for most of the work I do. Adjusting the domino for different tenon sizes is easy. This green switch at the top of the tool changes the width of the mortise for the five different domino sizes. The width of the mortise and the height of the mortise is also controlled by the size of the cutter or bit. The domino accessory bit kit includes five cutters. Changing bits is a snap thanks to some really fine engineering. All you need to change a bit is the small wrench provided with the domino. Use the wrench to release the locking tab, then slide the motor off the body of the tool. All you do is you take this wrench and insert it underneath this switch here and then pry the switch up. Now listen, see the switch releases the motor off the shafts here and then you just slide the motor right off the tool, just like so. To switch bits, use the small wrench to back the bit off the threaded spindle, then thread the new bit on. The bit on the domino doesn't just rotate like a router bit, it oscillates too. That's why the domino cuts straight shouldered mortises. The depth of the cut is controlled by this switch at the rear of the tool. To adjust the mortise for different length dominoes, first release the black locking lever, then lower the green switch. Like a biscuit joiner, you also have to adjust the fence on the domino. But unlike most biscuit joiners, this tool has preset fence adjustments for different material thickness. Trust me, once you start using the tool, all the metric measurements will begin to make sense, maybe for the first time in your life. Also, like a biscuit joiner, the fence adjusts so you can make angled mortises for beveled or mitered joinery, among other things. Now, another really nice engineering marvel with this tool is these shafts that the motor rides on are different lengths. This longer one is the first one you engage when you're replacing the motor, so it's really easy to find it. Just wiggle it onto that shaft, and it'll almost engage the shorter shaft by itself. Once you get the tool up to the proper point, listen to this. It just snaps into place and locks back on to the carriage. So it's a really simple tool to change a bit on. And these retractable pins at the base right here are another engineering coup. You can use these pins to index the mortise locations without layout marks or lines of any kind, which is what I'll do here. I have the fence adjusted for three quarter inch stock, so I'm going to take this index pin here and ride it right against the outside edge of this rail. So then I'm going to take the tool and swing around to this side. See, the tenon is going to fit inside of here perfectly. Having all the pieces laid out exactly as they're installed helps too. Otherwise, you can get really confused about which edge to index off of. So right now, we're going to put it here, and I'll index right off of this edge, and I'll clamp this piece down. And I'll take the tool and index right off of this edge. Now I want to index off of this edge. So I'll put this back here, clamp it down. One, two, three. Swing this around, this end goes here. So I'm going to glue this up, put a little glue in the mortise. I'll spread this glue out and seal up that end grain. And then we can put these tenons into those mortises. And they fit snug. There's one. And here's the other.
Perfect. So now I'm going to take the tenon and insert it into the mortises like so. And I'll put this one in too. And I can spread this apart just enough to get that tenon in there. There we go. We're ready to put the screws in to the pocket holes. So I'm going to put my clamp on right on top of that pocket hole. And I'm ready to run in these screws. That's one. We gotta do this end too. There we go. Now we're ready to finish all of the styles in the center in the field. Okay, now the easy part. I'll glue these all up and we'll put these last few styles right in the middle. I won't worry about this end next to me. I'll get the far end first. Just tap this over until it's right on my layout line. Run a screw into that one. Really, you know, if you're running a crew, this isn't something you ought to be doing. Try and set your guys up so that they can accomplish a lot of really productive work during the day and protect them as much as possible from making major mistakes. It'll make them feel a lot better and you too. When you hand this off to your apprentices, you can hand off the miter saw work too. Have a repetitive stop set up so that they can cut all the styles. And then the only thing you're going to be doing, and I just about put that on the wrong side of the X, did you see that? The only thing you're going to be doing is laying out the style, is, laying, is cutting the rails and laying them out for the styles. And that's what you should be doing, the layout part. I just slid that out of the way a little so I can get this wrench right where I want it and keep that style right on that layout line. There we go. So that frame's finished. And now we can do the next one. I'll just take this and set it against the wall here. And let this one sit while we put together this next one. Now this one we did in reverse because this is the longer frame and it's going to go on this wall back here. And I just want to make sure I didn't turn these around. It looks like I did. Let's make sure we got the right end in the right place. Here's the four inch style and this is definitely the longer frame. Yep. Yep. We want that four inch style on this side so I can either take this and put it together this way but then the layout's going to be wrong. So I must have flipped this. So I'll flip it again right now. So we got it set up right. So when I assemble this, I can lift it up. And we'll have that four inch style right in the corner where we want it. So let's pick up a couple of styles for the far end. And we'll do this frame exactly the same way. We'll start down on this end. We'll put two styles in. And then we'll come back and use the domino on that far four inch style to get it secured in the corner. I'm going to use that same glue bottle again. Spread these glue, spread the glue on these joints, seal up the end grain. You know what's really funny is Fast Cap just doesn't stop. They made this glue bottle and then just recently they sent me these new caps. So you take your old cap up, apart here. I mean if you're doing a lot of one by, you can slip your old cap right inside of this new one like that. And stick this back onto your glue bottle. If you're gluing up like a lot of end grain, a lot of like edge, edge gluing, you're gluing up boards, now you can take the fingers on this, on this glue bottle and use them to guide your, board, glide your glue bo guide your glue bottle right down the edge so you don't have to worry about shaking too much like I do. Your glue will stay right on the edge of the board. Okay, so this one's gonna go in like so. Let me move this over so that 
style is sitting on top of both rails. I'll get my wrench ready and we'll do this end first. I'll get that clamp right on the end, right on top of that screw and make sure this is flush. second one. Now we can switch back and get this one. I'm going to take this outrigger and slide it back out of my way. Isn't that slick? That easy to do. That joint is not tight. You can see it's got a big gap on this side. But see how it closes up from that, that screw being driven in there? And before I can drive this screw in, I've got to move that clamp in. So I'll put the clamp in right over the screw. There we go. That tightened up the joint and it drew both boards tight together. we've got left are these two small panels that go around the pop out. We'll do those next. Here's the two frames for that outside corner for that pop out over there. I've assembled this one already and I'm going to put this one together in just a second. But let's look at the style laid out on these two frames. If you run the rails past the styles, the ways those earlier frames are made, then the end grain on the rail is visible at the corner joint. I showed you that a while ago and you can see it right here too on the right side of this panel that goes on the outside of that pop out over there, you can see how the top rail and bottom rail run right past the style. So you can see the end grain right here. Imagine how that end grain will look once it's painted or stained. I mean, it's really clumsy. Instead, on outside corners like this, change your layout and run all the outer styles long past the top and bottom rails. In this room, these outside corner frames are pretty small around that little pop out. But the way I've laid out this outside corner is exactly the same way I'd do it on a long wall. Of course, you don't have to worry about end grain showing on inside corner to inside corner walls or walls that butt up against casing. Now let's assemble this other one. <laughs> It's 
see how handy this assembly table is. You can slide these pieces around until you have good support. And another thing, if these corners don't get perfectly flush, you don't have to bang on them much. You can use your wrench and twist your wrench, wrench one way or the other, and it'll slide the panels, the frames pieces, back and forth past each other until you get them perfectly flush right where you want them. See, I can adjust that piece just by turning this clamp and slide that piece back and forth until it's perfectly flush right here. that is the last panel and now we're ready to cut these frames to fit.